has been building champions since hair metal ruled the world. You're listening to the Coach Rob Podcast. Guys, well, thanks for tuning in to Coach Rob Podcast number 26. Welcome back to the show, Coach. What's up, brother? How are you, sir? Good to talk to you. I'm doing awesome, and we've uh, just gotten through Thanksgiving, and hopefully people didn't blow all of their gains throughout the year. But happy Thanksgiving, pro, uh, I guess a little bit late, and then happy holidays right back to you. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's that time of the year where we blaze through Thanksgiving, and all of a sudden we're like, hey, it's Christmas time, and then we're celebrating New Year's and going, hey, where'd the, where'd the year go? And turkey is white meat, so I eat seven pounds of it, which is healthy, right? Because it's it's not red meat, so turkey's good. The other white meat loaded with tryptophan that puts everybody to sleep fifteen minutes after you eat it. It's not it's not just the turkey though; it's the gravy and the taters and all that stuff after that. But uh, anyway, we're we're back. We've we've taken a few weeks off, so I guess everybody is kind of uh, primed and ready for the for the next podcast. This one's pretty neat too. It's going to be the difference between adrenal fatigue and Epstein Barr because we talk about adrenal fatigue a bunch. I don't think it you people understood how much it, it relates and affects all of us in a, in a way certain you know more than others but every aspect of your life adrenal fatigue comes into it so it's kind of neat that one of your listeners uh you know wrote in and so you thought you'd maybe go a little bit deeper on this you're exactly right uh this uh this podcast is a culmination of literally tens of thousands of emails that i've received over the years where people say hey look rob i've gone to the doctor I tell the doctor I'm absolutely exhausted, and they give me a couple defaults. Hey, you need to sleep some more, or they give them a script for some sleep medications or anything like that. And then we got, a, we got an email from Samantha in Kentucky. She was really frustrated. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just read her email just because I want to give her props. She said, hey, Coach Robin David, I'm struggling with exhaustion. I can barely make it through a complete day without a nap. I'm not talking about a casual nap. I'm talking about a nap just to get through the day. When I researched my condition and symptoms, I found both Epstein-Barr and adrenal fatigue. The more I researched, the more confused I became. Can you shed some light on what's going on with my body and what I can do to turn these symptoms around? Thank you in advance for your time and and feedback. Awesome. And I just, first of all, thank you, Samantha, for taking the time to email it in. And I want you to understand, I don't want to go around and throw a bunch of statistics out there, but the the scary part about is how many people have been misdiagnosed, and we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into this this afternoon, but just back in 2015, the Institute for Medicine estimated that 2.5 million Americans, not in the world, just in America, suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome, and here's the scary statistic, 80% of it goes undiagnosed. Yep. We don't know what to so, call it. No, nobody knows. It's, I mean, you you grow up, and uh, people have different labels for it. I mean, I'm tired. I'm, I'm you know I'm worn down or whatever. But you don't understand. It's it's a, a cyclical uh, thing in your life that if you don't fix it or break that chain, it, there, you know the harm you're doing to your body is exponential. Absolutely, and and that's why I wanted to do the podcast uh, today. And I want everybody who's listening to take a moment and grab a piece of paper and a pen, and I'm going to ask you to write what we consider the three stages. Now, before I go any further, I've had a lot of people get frustrated because they go, well, is Epstein-Barr and adrenal fatigue synonymous? Right. Is chronic fatigue and adrenal fatigue synonymous? What I hope to accomplish today is to kind of create a flow chart so any and every listener that may be going through, because we're going to dive into what the symptoms look like for each one, adrenal fatigue, Epstein-Barr, and then ultimately... I want you to go, we're going to provide you solutions. We do that in every podcast. We'll look at what 
are some symptoms, we'll look at some of the causes, and then we'll look at what we can do to turn it around. But I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to write down in this order what I consider is the flow pattern of fatigue. Number one is Epstein-Barr virus. Now, I'm going to refer to it in this podcast today as EBV for short, Mm -hmm. but it's imperative that you write it down first. The second is adrenal fatigue, and when you're making a note, I want you to underline the word fatigue. And then the third in this flow pattern is chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic fatigue syndrome. And I want you to focus on the final word, which is syndrome. Now, don't write any more than that. I want you to look at this flow chart. Epstein-Barr is a virus. Adrenal fatigue is a state of fatigue. And you'll notice that the final stage is a syndrome, Mm. meaning you've been enduring it for a long period of time, and now you've got what we consider clinical-level challenges. And we're going to go through this very briefly today, but I wanted to differentiate for people that go out, they do the dangerous thing called Google search on a web, you know, on a medical topic. Oh, boy, dangerous. And look out. It comes a million in different different directions and a a multitude of different ways it's described. I refer to the flow chart of fatigue as Epstein-Barr virus, adrenal fatigue, and then chronic fatigue syndrome. All right. So let's do a deep dive starting with Epstein-Barr. Now, I say this numerous times on our podcast. What we're going to talk about here for the next five minutes is sensitive. There's a lot of sexual connotations. There's a, everybody's got to put on their big boy, big girl pants, and let's talk about it. Epstein-Barr virus is actually part of the herpes family. Now, the reason why I wanted to start this flow pattern with an Epstein-Barr is it's exactly what the term describes it as. It is a virus. But people hear herpes, they think immediately of a sexually transmitted disease, but you've got to recognize that there's actually eight members of the herpes family. I'll give you an example of two benign ones that we've all dealt with, chicken pox and shingles. So when you look at it and you go, oh, my gosh, coach is being, you know, raunchy here, stop, stop, stop. Look at the Epstein-Barr as a virus. For the younger, when, when we were kids, uh, when we were younger and we were kids, you would sometimes be told that you came down with mono, also known as the kick, kissing disease. Sure. Well, the Epstein-Barr virus is the, the cause of mono, mononucleosis, excuse me. So whenever somebody says, oh, I, I don't have a, anything in my system that's tied in with herpes, well, if you've ever had mono, if you've ever had chicken pox or if you've ever had shingles, well, you've got the Epstein-Barr virus in your system. So don't look at it and panic and think you've got, you know, something more catastrophic. A lot of people have it. Now, I want you guys to understand that herpes is a Greek word meaning creep, and that's exactly what the Epstein-Barr virus does. So what a lot of people don't realize is because it is a virus, It can literally lay dormant in your system for years, and you don't even know you have it. Ironically, in the context of today's podcast, the thing that usually stirs up the virus is stress, Mm -hmm. something catastrophic in your life, like a divorce or somebody passes away. Yeah. If you get this going over and over and over again, and we talked about it in the last podcast, the categories of stress, personal, professional, interpersonal, chronic dehydration, inadequate food, et cetera, guess what? You're adding to those categories of stress. We don't know if it's you got laid off from your job. Is just enough stress in your body that you set this Epstein-Barr virus into effect. So what I want you to think about is the Epstein-Barr virus has been, there was a Polish study that was done back in 2015, and what they said was that the Epstein-Barr virus has a tendency to hide on the thyroid. Once that thyroid is overacted, you know, it's been activated and engaged, what ends up happening is the immune system attacks the thyroid. This creates an autoimmune thyroid problem, and then we start getting into other conditions of fatigue. Mm -hmm. So I want you to understand that the very first stage of fatigue starts with the Epstein-Barr virus, Now what I want you to think about is, remember how we said in our last podcast, when the fatigue stacks up, I asked you to draw that teeter-totter, 
and you have stress as a category on the left, and you have food and sleep on the right, and you're always striking for some level of balance. What you have to keep in mind is adrenal fatigue ends up becoming the next phase of this process. Well, get back to Epstein-Barr for one second, because yes. in our sport of, of motocross and supercross, back in the 90s, early 2000s, it was it was the buzzword. Everybody had it. That was every time that, that something, a rider was whatever, so it seemed like that was a buzz. It, it, we don't hear it anymore. But let me ask you this. It, it's a virus. So yes. Antibiotics don't hurt, uh, help it. It's not like you can take a pill. It's, it's a virus that has to run its course in your body, right? It has to run its course, and I want you to think about when your daughters had the flu. Mm-hmm. What did they do? They laid down. They would go to sleep. Yep. They'd wake up in a cold sweat because the body, quote-unquote, broke the fever. Sure. What is actually happening is your core body temperature will increase till it gets to a temperature that it literally cooks the virus and kills it. That's why your daughters woke up in a, in a drenched sweat. Now, what ends up happening is we become adults, and we don't want to recognize that we're tired. We don't want to recognize that we're relying on caffeine and stimulants to get through the day. We don't want to realize that we're running on five hours of sleep, and this is just literally wearing our bodies down from the inside out. I said this in the last podcast, but I'll reiterate it. We have to remember that cells make up tissues. Tissues make up systems. So when you think about running your body, and this is why, David, you bring up everybody was talking about having Epstein-Barr. It's having a virus and then the excessive levels of travel and training and the stress of competing causes the body to get overworked, stirs the virus up, and it's no different than you having, quote, unquote, flu symptoms. The difference is you got an outside microbe from a door handle, a handshake off of a glass, okay. and you say, oh, I came down with a virus. Your body runs its course. Eventually, you don't have that achy feeling in your body. You're not running a fever anymore. You start to feel better. If you think back, you mentioned motocross. When our athletes had Epstein-Barr, what was the prescription? You got to back off. Now, the challenge that you run into is if you have an athlete whose career hinges off of his or her performance, then there's that additional level of stress. Well, for me to get a contract for next year, i got to perform this year. So backing off seems counterintuitive. Well, what ends up happening is the body can only handle so much level of load. It's not getting an adequate amount of sleep and food, so the body doesn't get a chance to rejuvenate itself. And you bring up a really good point, David. If the body is working overtime, 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 the part of the body that tries to accommodate excessive amounts of stress is what we refer to as your adrenal system. We know it as our fight or flight. So now you've gone from a virus circulating into the body. You have a physical body that's not getting enough sleep. It's not getting enough food. And when it does exercise, it's exercising too long, too hard, and most often too many times per week. For the people that are not professional athletes listening to this podcast, Uh they may not have athletic pressures the way a pro does, but they have professional burdens, they have deadlines and budgets, they have relationship issues, they have financial issues. So it's not something that's only relevant to elite level athletics. Look at the epidemic of fatigue that we have amongst, let's just call it the general population. Mm -hmm. Now, that leads to, to the second of this flow process known as fatigue, someone will come to you and they'll say, okay, I have adrenal fatigue. What does that mean? Your adrenal fatigue is going to show up in the way of excessive levels of being tired no matter how much you sleep. They can try to go to bed. They don't sleep when they go to bed because they're either overstimulated. Maybe they're not getting the necessary macronutrients, specifically protein and fat, to satisfy appetite. So here's where the dominoes start to stack up. You've got a body that's physically and mentally, there's a key word, both mentally and physically, I I, I know the word fatigued is overused in this conversation, but mental and physical fatigue stacks up. Somebody tries to go to bed, doesn't satisfy appetite, so the body doesn't get a chance to rejuvenate itself mentally. That's done at REM level one. The body doesn't get a chance to rejuvenate physically. That's REM pattern three. So if the body doesn't get a chance to fall asleep and it doesn't stay asleep for a long period of time, 
you're literally, your motor is overrunning and you get a motor that has a lot of hours on it and it never gets a chance to get rebuilt. When does REM kick in for sleep? REM kicks in, it, there's, a, there's a different, some different ideologies with it. I've seen it range between 5 and 15 minutes. Wow. But you bring up, you bring up an important, important point, though. If you're using these sleep watches, you'll notice that it'll tell you how much time you're spending in that transitional, which is we refer to as REM 2. REM 2 provides you zero mental or physical recovery. Very, very dangerous place to be. So you could be, quote, unquote, laying in bed for eight hours, but if you don't get into the deep level of rest, you're number three, you don't get the physical rejuvenation. If you don't get into REM 1, and you go, well, how can we jump straight into REM 2? Because that's where your body settles in. It's, sleep patterns are very, very sophisticated, but for the context of this podcast, you want to satisfy appetite. You want to create an environment where the room is dark and cold and comfortable, mm-hmm. and you want to be able to fall asleep as quickly as possible into one and then three, then into three and then back into one. So you, you, can, set, you can be in REM 2 for eight hours? Yes, sir. Wow. Okay. There was, a, there was a watch that was out. They had a recall on them, unfortunately, but they were called the basis watch. And it, it, they used electric impedance on your wrist. And it would literally tell you how many times you rolled over at night, uh-huh. how much time you were in REM 1, 2, and 3. Now, the new heart rate monitors that are coming out, Garmin, Polar, a lot of these new mo- watches, they're adding the sleep component. And there's another thing called heart rate variability. These are all variables that are showing whether or not the body is fully recovering or not. What I want to encourage you is if you're not paying attention to your sleep patterns, you could be causing a lot of your own fatigue. And people go, well, isn't that kind of a Captain Obvious statement? You'd be surprised how many people will say to me, Rob, I can get by on five hours of sleep. And I'm telling you, you might tell yourself that and you may have programmed yourself but there is so much research that validates if you're not getting over eight hours of sleep, you're not getting adequately rejuvenated physically and or mentally, which then creates this problem known as adrenal fatigue, phase number two. Okay. Because your adrenal fatigue is your fight or flight. Now, I'm going to kind of convolute the conversation, but it'll take on a bigger purpose. If you don't go to sleep, your body doesn't rejuvenate mentally and physically But what it doesn't do is it also does not release HGH, human growth hormone. That's the hormone that makes you lean, and your body doesn't get a chance to produce more testosterone, which is responsible for the production of red blood cells. Someone may say, well, I'm not trying to win the Tour de France. I really don't care about my production of red blood cells. That's not, that's incorrect. I want you to change your perspective. Testosterone is, is responsible for the production of red blood cells, and red blood cells carries hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is an oxygen carrier, and that's where you're going to start having more energy. So everybody needs to worry about their RBC count, red blood cell. Mm-hmm. If you don't get to sleep and your body doesn't excrete both HGH and testosterone, you're going to be more fatigued, and you're going to start packing on body fat mm-hmm. because As the body produces excessive amounts of cortisol, which is a hormone that is released when the body's overstressed. I've used this before in a podcast. When you almost get into a car accident and you get that adrenaline rush, that cortisol gets dumped into the bloodstream, that's your flight or fight. And most of us go, well, I can can relate to almost getting into a car accident. It's pretty scary, pretty stressful. Well, look at what you're doing to your body. Your body is clamoring for sleep. You're laying down, but it's not getting what it needs. So it's almost like you're being forced to stay awake. Now, what compounds the issue is my mantra for our our entire company is I have a responsibility to improve everyone's health, then wellness, and ultimately performance in that sequential order. So this is where we bring in the ironic side of exercise. If the body is being underfed, either by caloric restriction or it's not getting the necessary macronutrients, carbs, protein, and fat, you just increase the stress on the body. If you're pushing the body too hard on the side of intensity and duration, you just added more stress to the body. If you run around chronically dehydrated, the body has to work harder to maintain core body temperature. 
you just added more stress to the body. So that's why in the, the when you I've asked you guys to think about a teeter totter, the category of stress is multifaceted, and the only thing that creates balance is sleep and food. So when you add the component of your body's already fatigued, you try to go to sleep and you can't because you're hungry, you don't get rejuvenated physically and mentally. And then you get up and you start your day again. You go, you know what? This is a new year. I'm going to drop those unwanted pounds of body fat. You add exercise. You're parasympathetic. Your adrenal system is overworking because it's trying to offset stress. Think about stress as a very big silo and everything that goes in it. That's why we always want people to think about the flow patterns of fatigue. You get a virus. If you get yourself excessively fatigued, for those of you, for those of our listeners that follow motorsports, motocross, kart racing, whatever, your motor's got 300 hours on it. You wouldn't put that aside, and you've got your national championship bike. That would seem completely ridiculous. Right, right. Well, you're 25 years old. You've gone through college. You're starting a new career. You get to the next stage of life. You've been in a career. Now you get married. You start a family. Then you get in the latter part of your career. Now your kids are getting into college. Think about what your adrenals have been doing over the last 20 years while you've been sleep-deprived, food-deprived, overstressed, and not sleeping enough. Stress stacks up. Now, this is why I want you to go back to the first thing I asked you to write down. Look at the flow pattern of fatigue. You have a virus that gets into the system. The body gets overworked. The virus gets engaged and activated. The adrenal system is now fighting a virus on top of stress of life. And then what ends up happening is you're doing this for years upon years upon years. Now, I'm going to pause right here for just a nanosecond. For somebody that's listening to this that may be very young, you're not immune to this flow pattern. A lot of these young kids, especially those that are dedicated to school and athletics, and they're doing a lot of community service, you're spreading yourself too thin. I cannot emphasize enough, parents, you need to back off. I had a client that called me. And they had a very young daughter. She was in middle school, playing basketball, going to the basketball practice five days a week, going guts to the wall. She's taking all these AP courses. This is exactly what I was told. My daughter is staying up till 2 in the morning working on projects and then getting up at 5 o'clock to finish it up to then go to school all day, to leave school, to then go to basketball practice. And her daughter has gained 33 pounds in four months. Does she live in China? That sounds like a, like a Chinese uh, upbringing. But that's what scares me is we're seeing more and more of this in America. Yeah. I see these, you know, we, you and I, David, we enjoy moto. It's the moto parents from hell. Mm-hmm. It's these collegiate parents from hell. I've got a, a, a person, not a client, but somebody who reported themselves to our office. And I had to tell the mom, you're killing your daughter. They're so hell-bent that they got to get them into a collegiate program. I don't care what sport it is at college. You think that that college program cares about your son or daughter's health and wellness? Yeah. You're a cog in a system. Travel ball, if baby. You, travel ball. Travel ball. I don't care that you've got a torn ACL. Get out there. Mm-hmm. I don't care that you've got tendonitis of the shoulder. Get in the water. Mm-hmm. And when you don't, we threaten to take your, spon- your uh, scholarship away. And then when you get done being in, let's take swimming, for example, at a collegiate level, they're in the water for three, four hours. Then they go to school all day. Then they do a second two-hour session. Then they've got some dry land work. They're, they're telling them that they're looking fat in their bathing suits. So now they're not eating. And you're putting your son or daughter into this environment, and you know they're dealing with it, and they're crying, and they've got weight gain, yeah. and, they're, and they're a mental mess. And you're like, come on, let's keep it up. We got to get that degree. We got to get that college scholarship. You're killing your kids. Stop. Let me ask you this: if, Looking back to your flow chart, are you saying yes. that all of everything we're talking about today, you have to have the virus first? No, sir. Okay. I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. I only put it in the sequence because of the emails that we got. Gotcha. What I did was I just paraphrased kind of the consistent questions about. Well, what is EBV, and how does that compare to, say, adrenal fatigue? So they are three separate indices, meaning that you can have Epstein-Barr as an as a isolated incident, then adrenal fatigue, and then the syndrome, obviously, with the longer – but those are separate issues. I, was, I want to clarify that because when you said you, the Epstein-Barr as a flow chart, I want to make sure that our listeners understood that adrenal fatigue is separate from the actual grabbing the doorknob and getting the virus. Yes, that's why I want you to think about 
Epstein-Barr has very similar symptoms as adrenal fatigue. That's why I said think about EBV as a virus. Think about it as kind of like a standalone. If that virus continues to wear the system down on top of all the other stress of life, your endocrine system is getting overworked, and hence you get into a state of adrenal fatigue, very similar characteristics of, you know, uh, dizziness, mental focus goes down the tubes, performance goes down the tubes, weight gain goes on. If the virus continues to stir itself up and you continue to overwork yourself and underfeed yourself and not get enough sleep, then you get a condition that we refer to as a syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, getting, okay. Back, to, getting back to the basis of, of these individual things, we talked about going to the doctor and being prescribed uh, you know, scripts for whatever. Why? I, I guess it's complicated for, for the layman, but why are these so over, overly misdiagnosed when, when doctors and physicians are looking at them? Boy, that's a, that's a great question, and it, it's something that disappoints me quite often, be, and, and I'm going to go on a public record, and somebody can hate on me if they want. I just feel that the way that the medical system is set up, these physicians are they're given a small window of time to see a certain amount of patients, and if they don't, they get financially punished. I just truly believe that that's the, the epicenter of the problem. And mm-hmm. I do have a lot of physician friends, and they say, Rob, I'm not allowed to spend any more time or I literally run into problems. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is I call it the puppy mill syndrome. You go in, David, you bring an athletic background. Uh, you, you have a lot of self-responsibility. I don't say that to blow smoke up your skirt. Anybody that knows you know it's true. Well, you go in there and the doctor is putting you under the same category as somebody that doesn't care, doesn't take care of themselves, smokes, drinks, eats bad food, that doctor's going to unfortunately see more of the person that doesn't take care of themselves than someone like yourself that does. So what happens? You get put into the same flow pattern of the person that is completely irresponsible right. and doesn't take their health seriously. Yeah, and so the I doctors think, are like, "Here you go." They they make jokes about how uh, like my mother in law when my father in law was sick, she she would have to write stuff down before she went to the doctor's office because when she would go in there, it would be such a boom, boom, boom. She'd leave and be like, well, shit, we didn't even ask half the questions that we wanted to ask because, like you said, it's almost like a scripted <laughs> play yeah. where the doctor comes in and says these three things. Okay, thank you very much. Here's your, you know, see, uh, here, you know check, check on your way out for your next appointment. Yes. Now, here, take your thread of thought right there and run with it. Let's talk about, I think you said, who was it, your mom, your aunt? Mother-in-law, yeah. All right, I'm sorry, your mother-in-law. So let's say that she writes down these symptoms. She goes in there. She says, hey, me or my husband, we're craving simple sugars. We're relying on caffeine for energy. We're exhausted all the time, no matter how much we sleep. Sleeping doesn't make a difference. I've got mental and physical disabilities. I'm exhausted and have dizziness when I stand up. I have poor concentration. I have body aches. Well, think about it. Somebody could describe that when they're fighting an Epstein bar. Sure, sure, yeah. Somebody could describe that when they're, quote, unquote, diagnosed as having adrenal fatigue. And if you look up chronic fatigue syndrome, you're going to find all those symptoms. They're going to be all parallel. That's where my listeners and that's where my emails come in and people are like, so what do I have? Do I have Epstein-Barr? Do I have adrenal fatigue? Do I have chronic fatigue syndrome? I always like to break it down into the flow pattern of a virus is current. Adrenal fatigue is kind of cumulative. And when you deal with that accumulation of fatigue for long periods of time, you get diagnosed of having a syndrome. And that's what I want people to understand. Let me say it this way. Anybody who has in, <laughs> has gone back home after going to the physician and kind of made to feel like you're an idiot because you go in there and they're kind of like, oh, you just, you just need to sleep more or you need to do this or do that. And you're thinking to yourself, but the person didn't really help me identify what's causing it and what do I need to turn it around. And that's why I created what I call the three tiers to recovery. Because it doesn't matter if you are young, and let's say we're fortunate enough and we have a young listener, 12, 13 years old, and they get mono. And people are like, oh, you know, my son or daughter's not out kissing at 12 or 13. They are. Get over it, okay? They're drinking out of a glass after somebody else. They're drinking out of a can of soda after somebody else. They got it. It's no big deal. What I want you to think about is it doesn't matter if we're talking about having the symptoms of Epstein-Barr, adrenal fatigue, or chronic fatigue syndrome. And David, I think this is an indirect. Now, this is 100% Coach Rob Soapbox. I think one of the reasons why you don't see what I'm going to recommend here is the three tiers to recovery because A, it's not sexy. 
Number two, it's not sizzling. And number three, it's so simple and sustainable, nobody wants to listen to it. And if you've been a follower of our podcast at any period of time, you probably can predict what I'm going to say in the next five minutes. Number one, the, the number one tier to recovery is improving your food quality and quantity. As a byproduct of food, you've got to get your hydration levels in balance. Number two, if you're eating well, you're going to sleep better. I said it earlier in the podcast. The only way your body will allow itself to fall asleep is when you satisfy hunger. The hierarchy of needs kicks in. You tell yourself you want to lay down. Your body says, nope, we're hungry. Feed us. So look at, look at it this order. Food quality and quantity have to satisfy appetite so your body can then be satiated to fall asleep. When it falls asleep, it produces HGH and testosterone. It rejuvenates the body physically and mentally. And guess what? You're on your way to recovery. Okay. Now, before, every, before everybody blows me up, they'll say, well, how long does that take? I don't know how deep of a hole you've dug yourself into. I don't want to be a negative Nelly, but think about it. If I've got somebody that's 50 years old, has gone through two divorces and, and had health issues, they've probably been through a little bit more stress than someone who's 17 and his biggest issue is getting to and from school. So I don't want to be snippy and say, yeah, do this, and in three months your symptoms will turn around. I don't know how severe or how long you've been fighting this. That's why I said to you earlier, think about the virus is current, adrenal fatigue is ongoing, and you do it for years, now you've got a syndrome. The third variable is balancing stress. Sounds very simple for Coach Rob to say on a podcast, but if you draw that line on your piece of paper and you put a triangle in the middle and you illustrate a triangle, the stress on the left can only be offset by number one and two, and that's sleep and food. And I don't care. I'll argue with this till anybody wants to, you know, until they want to run out of breath. The point here is we have gotten into a society where it's all about instant gratification. Everybody's a victim. Everybody wants to play the blame game. And, and I mean that sincerely. In my business, people that report themselves are a byproduct of one or all of these combined at some point in their life. And, David, you may look at that and go, screw you, Rob, I'm not. I'm not a whiner. I'm not a complainer. I don't play the blame game. No, you're right. But when your knee hurt, you didn't listen to it. You still ran until your knee hurt so bad you couldn't run anymore. That's not balance. You know, we always say you should be able to walk without pain. If you can't walk without pain, then what are you doing trying to run without pain Mm -hmm. or trying to run through pain? But as a human being, we go, but Rob, I've got this race date. Stop. You're going to go ahead and try to run through patella tendonitis because you've got a race in two weeks. And then you go out and you gimp your way through the race, and then you're all mantically depressed because you had a cruddy race. Well, what did you think was going to happen? If your knee hurts two weeks before a marathon, what makes you think running 26.2 on its sore is going to get any better over the race. The pain, pain's there for a reason. That's, that's, a, that's an indicator for your exactly. body something's not right. Yeah. Exactly. Now, this is why I want everybody to go back and listen to the first 25 podcasts that we've put out because we've hit these subjects directly and indirectly after and through every podcast. If you're hungry, you simply need to eat more. You need to eat more fat and protein. Why? Because that's what satisfies hunger. If you're not getting 8 to 10 hours of sleep, you need to make yourself a priority. If you don't, it's not Coach Rob's opinion. We're sitting here looking at medical documents of what chronic fatigue syndrome is, what adrenal fatigue is, what are the external signs of Epstein-Barr. Not my opinion. These are facts. It's documented. If you look at how the human body works, I want everybody to close your eyes. Think about your adrenal system in the middle. Think about the adrenal system has a funnel at the top. At the top of the funnel is where your food, your water, and your sleep drops into the funnel. What comes out the bottom of the adrenals is HGH and testosterone. So if you don't give it food and sleep and you don't stay properly hydrated, how can you expect the adrenal system to extract or excrete HGH and testosterone, which is an in that, which is an imperative hormone, set of hormones, that you need to be healthy, have a high level of wellness, and ultimately perform well. Now, that sentence right there, David, 
is why I think most people get the runaround in the medical system because that's too simple. I need to eat more. I need to sleep better and, and longer. And I need to control balance. Excuse me. I need to control stress both athletically, personally, and professionally. Well, how do I package that and sell that? I can't write a script around that. I can't make money on that. I don't get paid for people to listen to this podcast, but I have a personal passion to cut through the quagmire and the BS and get people to, first of all, you're not losing your mind. When you're exhausted and when you're grumpy and you're gaining weight and you don't know why and you're crying at the drop of a hat and you're short-tempered, Face it and recognize you need more food, high-quality food. You need more sleep, high-quality sleep. And you need to start saying no to negative people. You need to start giving yourself a chance to recover. When was the last time anybody that's listening to this, and if you have done this, I'm very proud of you, when was the last time you went to your favorite place? In 100% transparency, mind the beach. Mm Mm-hmm. I go to the beach as often as I can because that's my oasis. If I'm doing a hard workout or if I'm doing a half Ironman hard and I'm in a real difficult part, you know how races are, David. You have your low points no matter what. I visualize the beach. I listen to to the sound of waves at my desk all day long. Now, you can say that's fluffy. That's fine. But I'm doing everything I can to create balance. Right? And, and I just want people to understand the three tiers to recovery is food, sleep, and balancing stress. And if you don't take an active role in responsibility, bad news is nobody else is going to do it for you. Once you get above that five, six years of age, you know, not to be redundant, but anybody who's listening that has young kids, if their children become grumpy, what do you do? You feed them and put them to sleep. We grow into this title called adult. And the first thing we do is we don't eat, we don't sleep, and we go, hey, I don't know why I'm gaining weight and why I'm stressed out. Well, now you know. Yeah, so so you're, please you're, take you're, it you're, seriously. You're, you're not crazy. And uh, yeah. so when, when, when people are trying to tell you that you are crazy, you're trying to dismiss your, your symptoms, just know that you're not alone, that a lot of us uh, have suffered with it. And there are, there are uh, I think Coach Rob outlined well the ways to get out of this, out of this hole and to stop digging. And, David, I want to be very careful to make sure that nobody thought you said that with a, with a hint of laughter in your voice. Guys, we're being serious. I had a client who presented themselves to me who was on anxiety medicine, heavy anxiety medicine, and was having to take sleep aids. A prescription sleep aid was absolutely having nervous breakdowns. All I asked her to do was introduce fat and protein, and in six weeks, now, anybody who is on a prescription medicine, don't stop taking them without consulting Obviously, with your physician. Sure. I'm giving you what one of my clients, this was her experience. She no longer had to take her anxiety medicine. She doesn't have to take sleeping aids. And she's down 27 pounds. Now, this is somebody who has fought with her weight for years. It's not my opinion. This is not Coach Rob's experience. This is one of our clients. But you know what gets me extremely happy? You know what gets me out of bed in the morning? Is knowing that I changed one person's life by her being okay with eating fat and protein, decreasing her intensity of exercise, and her calling me, and I wish I could have recorded it. She was in tears of happiness Mm -hmm. saying, I slept through the night for the first time in 11 years. Well, I think that our, society, been... our society is overprescribed anyway, and if you can find natural solutions to your problems, I think that's good for everybody, your kidneys, your livers. Uh, I mean, it's, you don't need to be taking stuff for quick fixes when you know, uh, there's, there are holistic and simple solutions to these problems. Right, but the people's symptoms and frustrations are real, and that's what we want all of our listeners to know. David and I empathize with you. Sure. I've been I'll there. be very transparent. Yeah. I have a family. I've got two siblings that are still incarcerated because of these types of medications, dealing them illegally, stealing to get them. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to give people my dirty laundry. I want you to know this strikes an accord with me, okay? And it it breaks my heart because I hear people saying, I go to the doctor and they essentially make me feel like I'm an idiot. And we want, and I say, wait, David, I don't want to put words in your mouth. We're not making this comment lightly. It's affected both of us personally and we want you to know there is 
a way to get out from underneath it. And it's not a quick, it's not a quick fix. I'll go on public record as saying that. Mm-hmm. But you owe it to yourself to get a true understanding of food and understand the importance of sleep and let's get some balance back in your life. So I hope people understand that. I don't want to end the podcast on a humdrum. I want it to be yeah. optimistic. There's things you can do, like you said, David. That's awesome. So there it is. The uh, difference between adrenal fatigue, uh, the, the syndrome, and then Epstein-Barr, I think you've definitely uh, outlined and specified the differences between those and, and ways out of it. So that, that, that is awesome, Coach Rob. Uh, we've got some, some listener questions if you want to jump into those. Perfect. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, first one here is from Brian, North Carolina. Uh, does putting lemon in water make your capillaries stronger? That sounds like a Internet facade, but I don't know. Yep, I, I don't know the, the catalyst behind that. Um, the reason why you want to put water into a lemon is that it actually will change the pH and the alkalinity in your blood. Uh, by, I know this seems counterintuitive, but when you put a lemon in your water, it actually reduces the acidity in your blood. And when your blood is in a, more of an acidic versus a low pH level, yeah. you're more prone to disease. Huh. So put lemon, put water, excuse me, put lemon, fresh squeezed, raw lemon, squeeze it into your water. I don't know that it does anything for your capillaries, but it does help with the alkalinity and the pH balance in your blood. Healthy thing to do for sure. All right, Brittany wants to know: Is it better to go hungry or eat an energy bar? I think eat I, an I energy bar. Yeah, I was just going to say you're talking to Coach Rob. He uh, advocates yeah. eating every two hours. I don't think you want your body to go hungry. And, and the thing is, is I'm sure you know uh, if if anyone's listened to me for a long period of time, they're going to say, "Well, Rob just contradicted himself because he says." Don't eat anything out of a bar, bag, or a package. And you're right, but here's the thing. It, when the body is hungry, it becomes very irrational. We've kind of teased about this before. You go to school all day, and then you come out of school, and you're like a Tasmanian devil. Stabilizing blood sugar levels, it's beyond the scope of answering this question here, but it's better to kind of get that stabilized than to allow a huge insulin swing in your blood. Uh, a lot of bad things happen when you have real big swings so it's better to just try to stabilize it obviously try to keep the bar as a general rule of thumb the least amount of ingredients the better off it is and that's true to everything that you put in your mouth that has to come out of a box bag or a can okay uh, we have a few questions from uh, kai sangad from germany uh he has a, co- co- a few questions for coach rob here i really enjoy the new podcast so here are some questions Long-time listener of DMXS, our other po- motocross podcasts, uh, and anything Coach Rob wants, has a, a part to do with. So as for me, I'm 50, German, still riding GNCC, style races two or three hours competitively, been doing that for 10 years now. Here are three things I, I am possibly other struggling with. I fully understand how important warm-up is uh, because I just don't work. But what are the best, easiest ways to warm up if you can ride prior to the race and hate jogging, hate to uh, tell when you're actually warming up, uh, warmed up enough? Great question, and, and thanks for listening to us all the way from Germany. I always love to hear that. Thanks for the support. When it comes to a warm-up, if you're doing a GNCC race, and for our listeners that don't follow motor, uh, motorcycle racing, that's where we race our motorcycles through the woods for two to three hours. What, they, what they're required to do is they have to go get up on a grid, and we call them rows. So what I, what I would encourage you to do, uh, Kai, is – I would take a jump rope to the starting line. It's going to help do two things. First of all, it's going to activate your calves. I know it's difficult thinking you're going to jump rope in your motocross boots, but it will. you'll be able to do it. Uh, it'll get the heart rate up. It'll get the, the calves activated, so you'll be a little bit more prone to riding on the balls of your feet the way you should. Um, the other thing you can do is simply stop and do, drop and do some push-ups. Uh, do some walking lunges. Activate those quads, glutes, and lower back. I like to do push-ups because it gets the chest and the triceps and the front of the shoulders activated. Jump rope will get the whole shoulder girdle working. Uh, but if you don't have a jump rope, do some walking lunges and some push-ups. Anything that engages your quads is going to jack your heart rate up because your quads are the largest consumer of oxygen in the body. Doing so is going to elevate. But there was a little quick question that he threw there in the last sentence. Did I hear you correctly? He says, how do you know if you're actually warmed up? Yeah, like when, when do you start uh, getting, getting uh, fatigued for your, what you're racing for? But uh, yeah, how do you know you're warmed up? Well, great question. What I always say is, first of all, hopefully you're fit enough that you could do a 10- or 15-minute warm-up and not be tired for a three-hour race. And I'm not saying that to be sarcastic. If somebody tells me they're afraid that they're going to get tired warming up, they probably shouldn't race GNCCs. Um, to know that you're warmed up, what I always say is you want to be sweating profusely. Um, I say it that way every time somebody asks me. You should have sweat coming down from your brow. Your jersey should be wet. 
Uh, it's what we call the exothermic process. Your sweat, your coolant, your self-sufficient cooling system known as the sweating should be activated. And what you're doing is you're getting a, a, um, an energy system referred to as a lactic acid shuffle in your body turned on. That'll keep your heart rate from going from idle to literally redlining that first 90 seconds of the race. So it, I like your question about the warm-up because it's going to be twofold. If you do jump rope and or push-ups and walking lunges at the grid of a GNCC, you're also getting the lactic acid shuffle moving, and you're going to find that you're able to open that race up a lot easier because you're not going from idle to red line. So that's, if your body's sweating profusely, it's a good indicator that you warmed up. Little side note, especially for those of you like myself that live in Florida and it's warm all the time, just because you're sitting there sweating from the heat is different than sitting there sweating from activity. Let the sweat be from activity. You go, well, what if I'm sitting and I'm sweating? Then you need to sweat some more through movement. So don't forget that. Okay. All right, well, the, the next question is, in a two- or three-hour race, you burn quite a few calories. I often find myself really hungry mid-race. What should I do uh, to fuel right, uh, feel right without uh, feeling stuffed? I used to use the Mount maltodextrin, whatever that is, plus salt in a camelback, but uh, that may not be enough, and it uh, kills the camelback. Okay, that's uh, we could do a whole podcast on this, so I'll, I'll, I'll hit it top level. First of all, you should never allow yourself to be hum- become hungry, and if you are hungry, one of three things has happened. Either A, you didn't eat enough dinner the night before, B, you didn't eat enough breakfast before your race, and you're not getting enough protein during the race. Now, before anybody sends me a nasty email, in a GNCC race, your overall intensity should be, I'm not going to say aerobic, but it should not be anaerobic either. The higher the intensity, the more simple the food needs to be. So I recognize that it's difficult for an athlete to get protein in when you're racing something like a GNCC. But here's what I want you to keep in mind. You can snack on things like... um, those almond butter gel packs. There's other things that you can put in your system that are easily digestible. Now, to his point, getting hungry during the race tells me that you need to be scheduling your breakfast to where it's about two to three hours before your race. That allows you to digest, absorb, and purge. Then what you want to do is you want to be getting a roughly 100 calories every 30 minutes. Wow, okay. So I, if, if you're using a camelback, which it sounds like he is, you need to do the science backwards to figure out, and I know this is tedious, how many total ounces does your camelback hold, and then mix your sports drink so that you're getting roughly 100 calories every 30 minutes. Now, I do recognize it's difficult on the camelback to get it cleaned out, but, you know, racing is expensive. It's a lot less expensive to change the bladder of a camelback than it is to go out there, bonk, and not have a good race. Right. The idea of not feeling stuffed, you just have to practice in training. So what you want to do is, you know, play around with like an energy gel, maybe a banana and some almond butter. Go ride for an hour and see how your belly feels. If you feel bloated and you feel nauseous, try something different, but keep notes. That's what we do with all of our clients. But to his camelback question, set it up so that you're consuming 100 calories every 30 minutes. Now, you're literally going to have to do what we call the spit test. When you bite your camelback and you suck that in, I don't know if you take one, two, or three-plus gulps, and that is going to dictate how many calories you're getting in. It sounds complicated, but it's not. If you only take one sip of your camelback and it only gives you 12 calories, you're not getting enough calories. That's why you're getting hungry. Mm -hmm. That's why you're bonking. Like I said, we could do a whole podcast, but... Um, if he wants more of a deep dive on that, he can email me and we'll do it. And anyone else listening, for that matter, that may be doing GNCCs. And and try all this shit before the race. Don't do it today. Uh, please. We, we talked about that. Please, because otherwise you're going to poop your pants. All right, last but not least, uh, this is the still from Kai Sanga from Germany. Last but not least, I need to lose weight because I have to carry it uh, through the race. Sure. It want to, I, w- I want to be fat. <laughs> His English is, is good. <laughs> sure, it want it to be fat only. I am six feet, one hundred ninety eight pounds. I do have more than average muscle and want or need to lose around another ten fifteen pounds. But at the same time, I try to improve endurance and strength and understand I need to be fed. <laughs> okay, 
Um, I'll admit, uh, though, I've improved my diet. I still love beer and, and snacks. In theory, I have enough time to train, but struggle with a stressful job, which often keeps me from training. We'd love to hear about that in the podcast. Resort, uh, regards, Kai. L- well, lots Kai, in that question. Again, thanks for listening. Um, this is going to kind of take a paradigm shift here. One of the reasons why you might not be able to drop the weight is for what we spoke about earlier in today's podcast, and that is you mentioned here that you're working a lot. You probably have a family. What's happening is you're not getting enough sleep, and you're dedicated to wanting to be a good racer. So sometimes you just have to recognize that you're exhausted and you'd be better off going home and eating and going to bed early than hitting the gym on the way home and throwing some weights around or doing some cardio. Now, that sounds completely crazy coming from a human performance specialist. Yeah. But what I want you to think about, what I do for my clients on a daily basis is I look at the analytics I look at their food logs. I look at their training logs. I look at their average and max heart rate during the workouts. And we make decisions on a daily basis to say, you know what? Today is not the day to do your 10 by one mile intervals. Your body woke up. Your heart rate was elevated. The scale was elevated, which showed us inflammation and swelling. I don't want to go on a a bunny trail here. This is what we call our analytics side of our business. If you go to any of our websites, we provide this service to everybody Whether or not we design your workouts or not, we have a complete analytics department, and we can help clarify what your body is doing and why it's doing it. That's all I want to say about that. But in Kai's position here, if he's struggling to lose weight, maybe there's days when he's going to the gym and he shouldn't because it's, remember what we said, it's driving up his cortisol, the byproduct of stress in the system. You go to work for 8 to 10 hours. You know, say you were busy, you missed a couple meals, you didn't hit your water properly, your body is not really in an ideal state to go do a workout after work. Let's, let's put it, because he races motorcycles, let's put it in the context of riding a motorcycle. You didn't put enough gas in the tank, your radiator's half full, and your oil in your bottom end of your casings is nearly empty. You wouldn't say that's bike, that bike's in a great condition to go do a three-hour GNCC race. Right. Well, you got up with only four hours of sleep. You went to work for 12 hours. You didn't eat enough and you didn't drink enough. Do you really think you should go push yourself to work out? I'm not saying I understand that little negative canary on the the shoulder wants you to be, oh, I'm being soft. Oh, I'm not being dedicated. No, I'm being irresponsible. No, you're doing the opposite. You're listening to your body, giving it what it needs, and you will reap the long-term benefits to that. But I do want to say one thing about him, about the question about calories and losing weight. I get get emails where people disagree with me all, and I'm okay with that. I've got 34 years of success, and I don't say that arrogant. I say it very humbly. When you're out there doing your cardio, if you want to burn more body fat, you've got to bring the intensity down. If you keep pushing the intensity up into those anaerobic lactate threshold intervals, intensity levels, you're burning more stored sugar from your liver and your muscles and progressively less and less stored fat. That's it. If you're telling me you want to drop body fat, as Kai just said, bring the intensity down. Now, again, I've gotten some emails from people that are into the HIT training, the high-intensity interval training, and they're like, yeah, well, then why are all these athletes lean and all that? That's great. HIT training works if somebody can get adequate amount of food adequate amounts of rest to be able to handle what? The stress, which is associated with high-intensity training. I personally have never met an individual that has that much time that they can eat and sleep enough to support high-interval training. This is why I've got clients that have been successful for decades, and literally decades, because they didn't buy into the different fad exercise. These high, I'm going to call them out by names. P90X, Insanity, all super slow. All of these fads that have come and gone, why do they fade? Why do they fail? Why do they fade into the distance? It's a non-sustainable system. I'll argue that with anybody because the protocols that I have my clients on today are what we did back in the early 90s. But what we do is we work on balancing the stress of life, the stress associated with fitness, and then we balance that with food and sleep. And, again, we've been doing it for 34 years with staggering results. I'm not boasting about it, but when somebody wants to get on a platform and say, oh, well, with my performance coach, we do high-interval training, and he or she's got me on a calorically restricted 
great. Call me up in a year and a half and send me a copy of your blood work. Right. I guarantee you, you'll have screwed up blood work. You'll have all kinds of physical and blood chemistry issues, and you're one miserable individual. Not sustainable. Not being negative. Yeah, not sustainable. I'm just telling you. Okay. That's right. It's not a sustainable system. Well, Kai, so that, hopefully he, that Kai, thank you so much. Sorry, David. You know, Kai and and all the people that had Brian and Brittany uh, had their questions answered. That's that's how you get this stuff done. We, uh, I think, uh, Coach Rob, the proof is in the pudding, and he answers these questions each and every show. So make sure you guys hit him up. And Coach Rob, talk about uh, before we leave here. What, what are some of the new projects you have going on there? Well, we've been having a lot of fun. Um, if anybody's been following me on social media, you'll see where we launched what we call our One Percent Better series. What we're doing once a week is we're, we're doing a YouTube video. I give you, literally, it's 90 seconds long. I give you something that you can do that upcoming week. We put them out every Monday. Okay. So that's what we call our 1% series. If you're not following us on the social media platforms, please do so. Um, in addition to the 1% series, we try to give you some tidbits and some suggestions. Uh, if you've been following us on social media, you'll see that we launched our cookbook and our smoothie recipes. I'm super pumped about that. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to say we're, we're selling a bundle of them. Uh, we put them out there. We hope you guys will send them to your loved ones, your best friends for Christmas. Um, obviously, we're in the business to, to make money and support our families, but I don't want this to sound like a sales pitch. We put those cookbooks and smoothies together because we received emails from people saying, what in the world should I be eating? So they are things that I make for my family. Um, they're things that are very simple. I'm a typical guy. I'm not a certified chef. You're not going to see a dish of this and a dash of that. It's everything you can find at the grocery store and things that you can make in 15 to maybe 30 minutes. And then I did mention that we, you know, our analytics service, we've been getting a lot more requests for that. So I hope people are aware of it. Uh, one of the things that does break my heart doing this for such a long period of time is when someone goes, well, I didn't know you did that. That just guts me. Because <laughs> yeah. it's the, it's the so, foundation of, of tracking your progress. Well, that's exactly it. And, you know, we want everybody to understand that, you know, we have a passion to increase people's health and wellness. And when they do cross that line into wanting to be better athletes, we, we hope that you guys will lean on us for a performance program. We have some new announcements that will be coming out in January, some new resources, uh, both on the educational bundle side. Um, I've got a new launch that will happen in January that I think a lot of people will, uh, well, I know they will be because they've been asking for it. And then we've got another big project that will launch in June. So we're, we're trying to get something new once a quarter for you guys. Um, human performance doesn't sit stagnant, and neither do we. And for people that have been following us for years, what we want you to know is we don't ever want our information to ever become stale. Uh, we spend a lot of time raking over periodicals from the National Training Center there in Colorado Springs, and we want to bring you guys the latest and greatest cutting-edge facts, not my opinion, but what these, what these researchers have tested and I have a responsibility to get this back out to you guys. So, as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting the websites and the resources. Do me a favor, order some cookbooks. Uh, you know, send those to your loved ones. I'd love to hear people sit telling me that they love our, our energy smoothies and immune boosters and stuff. It's awesome. I just I love to get feedback from athletes All right, the co- and, and people that aren't. Yeah, the Coach Rob store with 2 bscom And your, your contact email, Rob, one more time from a new listener maybe? Yes, if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. You can reach us at contact at coachrob.com. That comes to our customer service department. There are no silly questions. As you saw in today's podcast, your question may end up on the – and just so, just an FYI, yeah. we don't put someone's question out there without their permission. So if you just don't want to talk about it yeah. or you're afraid your name or if you say, yeah, you could do it, just change my name, we would never do it without your permission. So please understand that. But Not- these questions – and I do want to say this. These podcasts are not about Coach Rob. It's about giving you guys the answers to your frustrations. My YouTube channel is not about Coach Rob. It's about addressing your frustrations and creating some clarity. Any resource that we put out there is not about the Coach Rob brand. It's about you. I said this in the last podcast, and I mean it sincerely. Unfortunately, my name is Rob. We have to use it. Other than that... <laughs> You don't want to listen to me talk. You don't want to watch me on video. I get it. But what I do want to do is solve your frustration. So please continue to engage with us. We appreciate it. We're thankful. Our emails are in the tens of thousands per month now, and we humbly are are very thankful for that. So thank you. 
for sending those in. All right, Coach Rob Podcast number 26 is in the books. Guys, we will be back uh, in two weeks with another one here during the uh, before the holidays start. So, again, visit uh, Coach Rob's sites. Again, CoachRobStore.com, and uh, you have the contact email for questions. Coach Rob, thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. All right, peace. peace. Okay.